That's the world's second largest manufacturer of clothing and business is growing. Now, though, Bangladesh is being threatened by trade sanctions if it doesn't improve safety for its garment workers. But will sanctions work? Will the international companies that rely on Bangladeshi labor comply? And what will it mean for the cost of their products? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Mass funerals have been held for dozens of garment workers among those killed in last week's building collapse in Bangladesh. Bodies are still being dragged out of the rubble and the number of people killed has climbed to well over 400. The European Union is considering a review of its trade policies with Dhaka to encourage improvements in safety. Thousands of Bangladeshi workers demonstrated in May Day rallies to demand the death penalty for the owner of the factory who is under arrest. Bangladesh is now a major hub in the global supply of cheaply made clothes for budget retailers. It's an industry that's worth about $20 billion a year. That makes Bangladesh the world's second largest clothing exporter after China. Around 3.6 million people work in the clothing industry there. Most of them are women working in unsafe conditions while earning as little as $38 a month. Bangladesh is vulnerable to economic sanctions imposed by the European Union. It's the country's biggest export market, worth $11.4 billion. That's followed by the United States, a market worth over $4.5 billion. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our three guests. From Geneva, Deepu Moni, uh, Bangladesh's Minister of Foreign Affairs. From Brussels, Ben van Pepperstrater, coordinator and international policy officer for the Clean Clothes Campaign. That's an initiative set up to improve working conditions in the global garment industry. And from Dhaka, Shafiul Islam Mohyuddin, president of the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Deepu Moni. Minister, where does responsibility for a tragedy like this ultimately lie? Well, um, the responsibility lies uh, actually uh, in many places, but Bangladesh has never shied away uh, from reality, and uh, we are ready, fully ready, uh, to find out all the gaps and limitations, and we are prepared uh, to take appropriate actions so that such kind of um, uh, tragedies do not occur again. Well, Ben van Pepperstrata... There are many sides to it. The owners, the building owners, the government, uh, the, uh, uh, the implementer of, of laws and regulations, and even the buyers and consumers. Uh, so there are many sides to it. Uh, but the... Uh, most important thing is uh, that we find out all the gaps, all the limitations, and, and then we uh, take appropriate actions. Well, Ben van Pepperstrater, it would appear that there are many, many issues within this, that it's maybe not possible to isolate any single cause or any single entity that, that is responsible. Well, um I, I, I would not use uh, the fact that there are um, multiple responsibility, uh, responsibles uh, as, as a way of not really uh, attributing a, a form of responsibility to individual actors of, or groups of actors and not as a barrier to really come at solutions. So in terms of really looking at responsibilities, we uh, from the Clean Clothes campaign look mainly at uh, brands uh, government, state, and um, factory owners, um, building owners. So I think if we, we, we see those three groups and, and, and really uh, attribute what part of the responsibility lies within them, I think that is uh, a crucial fac uh, step to, to make in order to move forward to uh, make sure that this never happens again. Well, Shafiul Islam, your view on that, where should responsibility lie? Yeah, already, you know, BGMA and government is working side by side. You know, government already announced and, you know, immediately the response of the government, you have seen that the garment owner 
who failed to comply the instructions of the BGMEA that day we got the warning that we found a crack and immediately we sent a team to that building to stop work until it has been certified by the qualified engineer. So they fail and immediately we have asked, uh, as per government request, we have asked the owners to surrender to the law and they have surrendered and they are now behind the bar. And accordingly, the engineers, those who have certified to build this building, they are behind the bar and the owner of the building who forced, as we heard, that to, for work and certified by some um, authorities or, or he wanted to sell it. But somehow all the responsible, those who are, they are all behind the bar and we are looking forward to see that justice will be there. Well, well, the we and understood. law will be enforced against them. Well, if, if I may just interrupt you there, uh, apologies, Shafil, but it does appear that the building that actually collapsed had been illegally developed. Uh, there had been another three stories built on the top. Now, this will, of course, be the subject of further investigation. But Minister Deepu Moni, to what extent can the government get directly involved in ensuring that the laws that are there are followed, that things like construction follow certain safety parameters that are within the protocols of the country and of each and specific city? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a question of implementation of the laws. It's a question of people abiding by laws. Given our history of impunity in the country uh, with huge uh, crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide and also killing of uh, father of the nation, when that impunity prevailed in the country, people uh, did not... Uh, think that they uh, they would they were required to abide by the law but now it's it has changed this government uh, since past four years we have been uh, ending impunity we have been working on account establishing accountability everywhere and as a result you know that uh, just the day before uh, this collapse happened the inspections were done and this building was identified as an unsafe building so now what we have to do is like we have been doing for the past four years that we will have to be more uh, doing much more now uh, together with all the stakeholders in this sector to see that people comply with with uh, requirements legal requirements everyone wherever they are whichever role uh, they are playing that whatever they are supposed to uh, comply with that they do comply with so the government uh, will in its uh, capacity. Uh, it will use its uh, fullest capacity to ensure that people do comply and that these things, these tragedies do not occur. We have limitations, we have gaps, but we are working together with everyone concerned now and uh, we hope that uh, these tragedies uh, will not happen. Well, Shafiul Islam, um, uh, we heard there the uh, possibility of the different context uh, within the country itself, the culture of unaccountability that grew up in past years, which is now having to be addressed. To what extent do you believe this is a valid point that many within Bangladesh, because of its uh, past, actually do not feel accountable to any law? You see, this is a phenomenon development, you know. They have surrendered to the law and the engineers, they have surrendered and they have captured and they are behind the bar. This, this reflect that country has law and implementation is there and we must rely on it. And we are hoping that we don't want to see this kind of life losses anymore. And we cannot afford, we want to build our industry and make our industry sustainable. And we have to ensure the workplace safety, occupational health and safety is a priority for Bangladesh. As we have proved in the, in the past that we have worked along with ILO we have eliminated child labor and rehabilitated them. In this case, I can assure you and the world that Bangladesh will do it and whatever is necessary. Today, we have formed three committee under the leadership of the Rajuk chairman, you know, which is, which is the authority and the civil engineers department head of Buet and others committee members, core committee and other committee has been formed. 
to inspect the city industry and outside the city suburban industry will be inspect under the leadership of the labor ministry so if we go ahead like that and if we see it positively we cannot bring back those who has lost their loved one but we, we have to work from now on without wasting any more time to prevent the future any more incident this well, kind of tragic incident well if, if i if i may just interrupt you there because i'd like to go to, to ben van pepperstrater we hear there that efforts certainly uh, are appear to be being made within bangladesh itself by workers by the unions by the government itself what else can be done do you believe what is the first uh, starting point that one should address to prevent tragedies like this from happening again well um uh, first of all, I think it's 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 good to understand that um, the tragedy in Rana Plaza is actually um, a sort of a symptom of a, a much more systemic uh, state of affairs in terms of building and fire safety of of, of uh, garment factories in Bangladesh. So, in that sense, the solution at our side would uh, that we would propose would also be uh, on a systemic level. And um, there we see a role, as, as mentioned by the two other colleagues here, um, for better implementation of existing laws. But we would also see a role of, of, of also more expanding um, those and also involving within uh, the corporations with, for example, the National Action Plan, the ILO and so forth. We would also see a role for uh, the brands that source from Bangladesh. So uh, we are pushing the brands to uh, sign up to the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Building Agreement, which was uh, developed a few years ago uh, following the Spectrum factory collapse, uh, uh, collapse and uh, which would actually propose a comprehensive program with all stakeholders, like lo uh, both local stakeholders, local unions as global unions, as well as the brands, to start monitoring all the factories that those brands have a presence. Uh, based on those monitoring, um, look at um, how we can develop plans uh, for structural reforms and also a mechanism uh, that, that uh, identifies who should foot the bill, which we think is uh, a division between both the factory owners and the brands. And last but not least, and there I'm, I'm referring to the existing legal framework where we think it falls short, is obviously the role that trade unions can play within a plant or within a factory. And there the agreement uh, foresees uh, an access and the establishment of health committees where uh, workers' representatives can proactively signal any deficiencies that, uh, that might hamper um, the building and, and, and fire safe, uh, safety. Um, where they can signal that there is no fire extinguisher or uh, where there is no um, uh, emergency exit, because sometimes it really boils down to these kind of uh, simple things. I'm here we were talking about a violation of building codes uh, and, and structural integrity, but uh, November's fire in Tazreen also made more simpler things clear, just as the. Uh, such as the lack of uh, an emergency exit. Well, well I want to pick which, up on that uh, particular point, when, when if I may, Ben to, uh, von Pepperstrata. You mentioned there the systematic nature of what's been happening. Well, last week's building collapse is just the latest disaster to take place in the last five months. In November last year, as mentioned, a fire broke out in a seven-story building near the Bangladeshi capital. At least 112 people were killed in what was then Bangladesh's worst ever factory accident. A few days later, another fire broke out in a smaller building used to manufacture clothes. After those events, a number of Western companies said they would re-examine the safety procedures of their suppliers. And yet we now have a, another a disaster. So to what extent should the companies outside Bangladesh, uh, those who are employing local suppliers within the country, to what extent do those external countries have a responsibility? Let me put that question to you, Shafil Islam. I am asking, it's not a time to blaming each other. We must be positive, you see. The commandable job, our military has shown our red christian and the, and the general people you see it's a combined effort we have seen the way they have rescued that's why almost 2500 lives can be saved so here we like to see the collaborative approach from all the stakeholders those who are in the supply chain today after the super store concept you know they are dominating it's a it's a it's a buyer's market 
here we need to, if they can share a, a penny, you see, like 10 cents or 20 cents more for a, for, a, for a government, you know, we can create and we will put some money on that, government sh should come forward, you know, we know compliance is the investment, it is not very much possible for all of us. Some of them, government has already taken the initiative for relocating the industry and they have allocated 500 acres of land and gradually, once it's through, one by one, it will be improved. We are now concentrating on, you know, looking and identifying the vulnerable factories. The committee has been formed within short possible time. If we could do that, where I will ask all the stakeholders like buyers, all should come forward to work together, make a steering committee. You know that we have already engaged for better work program launched by ILO. So we have been working and we are very much open and transparent to work together with any stakeholder. Well, we heard there, for example, the issue of profit. Obviously, that is why the factories are placed there. And there is an issue, and I'd like you to pick up on this, Ben von Pepperstrata. We know, for example, in 2011, Walmart, one of the chains that does have a uh, suppliers in, in Bangladesh, uh, Walmart shareholders voted 50 to 1 against receiving safety reports from their suppliers. Now, this may change in the light of the recent uh, tragedies, but there does appear to be a resistance from the brands, from the companies, to engaging directly in ensuring that the people that supply them with the garments that they sell are complying with proper safety regulations. How great an issue is this, Ben von Pepperstrata? Well, I, I think this is one of the root causes uh, that we are facing. The, the, I, I think there, there is a difference between some of the brands who acknowledge that they have part of a responsibility towards uh, uh, systemic issues in the Bangladeshi textile sector. Uh, and others such as Walmart who completely deny any responsibility with any wrongdoing. So it depends a bit uh, which, uh, which brand, but obviously there is, um, as, as, as one of the colleagues already said, it is a buyer's market. So the, 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 the amount of leverage that the brands have to actually make positive change in uh, the textile sector in Bangladesh is, is huge. And in that sense, um, it is a bit of a political choice of brands whether or not to engage into, uh, in, in, into structural re uh, reforms. For those brands who then uh, do not, uh, choose not to do that uh, and are faced with uh, tragedies uh, such as Rana Plaza and Tazreen, uh, I, they do that in, uh, on a basis of actually knowing what, uh, what kind of systemic issues are there in the Bangladeshi textile industry. So in that sense, uh, we consider this actually a form of, uh, of negligence uh, with all its uh, judicial connotations. So there we see a responsibility for brands and we see brands not taking up that responsibility to the full extent that they actually carry that weight. Well, we are hearing from the European Union that they are looking at uh, the duty-free and quota-free access granted to uh, Bangladesh for uh, these supplies. Um, Deepa Moni, Minister, how much of a threat is this to Bangladesh and to the workers of Bangladesh, uh, the EU, even considering to take away these privileges that the country has in terms of accessing the European Union markets? Well, uh, from Lady Ashton um, and Mr. Gurtz, um, uh, the EU Trade Commissioner's joint statement, um, it is very evident that they're not thinking about taking away, but they're thinking about very positively, in a very supportive way, um, constructive way, they're looking at it, and they're saying that they are going to incentivize um, responsible management. And they have also talked about uh, uh, corporate social responsibilities. So I think uh, the EU statement and uh, the fact that some major brands from different countries, they have also come forward. I think this is a very positive step. and. Uh, Combined with the government's effort, the private sector's effort, um, now uh, the uh, friends from outside like EU, uh, our major market and, and some brands, I think uh, it's going to be, we are now going to work together uh, in collaboration uh, and uh, in order to make this huge industry um, safer and more compliant because this is a sector uh, which has contributed a lot 
to uh, our economic growth as well as uh, job opportunities uh, for a lot of people, including mostly women. And so we want uh, we can reassure uh, everyone and that and we can also we are going to uh, demonstrate to the world that we are committed. Uh, Bangladesh is committed, our private sector is committed, um, that we want to make it safer and more compliant. And we need support from the buyers and also from the consumers. So uh, Bangladesh has proved that it can produce quality garment and that it can provide quality and value to world uh, customers. So now we want also them uh, to stand by us so well, that we've had, uh, we can make this sector uh, safer and more compliant. Well, well, we have had plenty of reaction on Facebook. Anthony Vita says, we throw away enough food every day to feed all, and yet we still exploit two-thirds of humanity. Don't think I need to say more. It's time to change. Jamie McCroskey says, I bet companies are paying a fair price for goods, but the factory owners are not sharing the wealth of their employees. I'm amazed that they will still import from Bangladesh at all. This is slave labor. And Nathan Astorga adds, big companies are buying cheap labor, and this is just an example of the consequences of their greediness. Companies coming under attack, but what about governments? Well, what should governments do? We have been discussing this, but Pen Ben von Pepperstrater, your view, is there a specific role for the government here, have we been hearing from the foreign minister of Bangladesh? Uh, well, um, maybe maybe to start with the government of Bangladesh, they already touched a bit upon that. Uh, I, for them, there is a, a, a task of not only better application of the law, because uh, I, there is rightfully mentioned that there is a problem with uh, uh, law application and very, uh, the, the monitoring, uh, how is compliance being done with uh, building standards and so forth. But there is also, I think, quite a lot of legislative work for the Bangladeshi government to make sure that uh, it aligns itself with uh, what the international community would uh, would consider ki uh, core human rights standards and core labor standards in terms of like freedom of associations, granting access to trade unions inside factories to um, to actually represent workers and 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 their needs and so there on on that level we we do see some work uh, for the Bangladeshi government uh, also the Bangladeshi government together with. Uh, factory owners um, will need to actually raise wages in uh, the garment sector in Bangladesh um, um, because they, these are if, basically too if, low. If to I could just interrupt you there, my apologies, uh, Ben von Pepperstrater, but I'd like to put yes. that question directly to uh, Deepu Mani. We hear there the mention of wages. Is there the possibility that the government must look at raising that minimum wage in Bangladesh as a way of averting these tragedies, Minister? Uh, yes, the government has already, um, uh, in 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 the past, raised that, and uh, it was raised almost 100 percent. But have we reached uh, the goal that we want to uh, achieve? No, we are far from it, and we are constantly working towards it. And that is why only about three weeks ago, a cabinet committee, a very high-powered cabinet committee, was formed only to look at this industry, the RMG sector. And uh, the, this committee has, in its first meeting, has taken very hard decisions. And we are now going to implement all those. And the um, amendment to our labor law, um, that has also been approved by the cabinet uh, recently, in, in two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, and and uh, we are going to take it to the parliament. So I think in the whether to um, bring in new laws or regulations or implementing uh, the existing laws and regulations, we are now working together with uh, all the relevant stakeholders, and uh, we will see uh, much better uh, uh, results in the future. But. Uh, I want to come back to one well, point. Well, if, if I may, there at this particular many, point, many we've come to which are an unsafe. end of the show, I'm afraid. Much work to be done. But thanks to all my guests in Geneva, Deepu Moni, in committed. Brussels, Thank Ben you. van Pepperstrater, and Shafil Islam Mohidin in Dhaka. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.